Claudio Chiapucci, the man who laughed because his teammate, Roberto Panin, cheated on his girlfriend with hostesses in the Vuelta a España. The same man who lied like a fool to ensure that everyone thought massive doping in cycling began with Lance Armstrong. Claudio was the winner of one of the most doped competitions of all time, the Milan San Remo of 1991. The culmination of a transformation that made him go from a simple domestique to a winner of a monument and three times podium finisher of the Tour de France. 150 kilometers that the devil escaped to raise his arms alone in the Via Roma. And that was the first great exhibition of EPO and just what that famous three-letter substance could do. And at that time, it could be bought for a mere $200 in a Swiss pharmacy without even giving identification. Although in the case of Chiapucci, a guy with only five victories in five years as a professional, he wouldn't even need to present any for himself. It all started in March 1990. Francesco Conconi and Michele Ferrari had started to experiment with EPO, replacing blood transfusions with which they had revived Moser, as we told you in the previous video. EPO was much cheaper and easier to take. It was undetectable in anti-doping controls and doping programs could be planned far easier than when they were carried out in the 1980s. The two doctors started doing business in different Italian professional teams and put their experiments into practice, with the massive success of Gianni Bugno in Milan San Remo, where he won overwhelmingly, and then even more incredibly, in the Giro d'Italia, where he wore the Malia Rosa from the first to the last day, without anyone being able to come close to taking it away from him. However, Conconi and Ferrari were not only working for the Swiss-born Italian cyclist Chateau Dax, they were also negotiating with riders from other teams independently, since, having the protection of the Italian Olympic Committee, they could use their experiments with other guinea pig riders and at the same time earn much more money. One of these guinea pigs was the ambitious Claudio Chiapucci. Until then, practically an anodyne mediocrity who fought for flying goal classifications and trying to get into breakaways, and who had only two victories as a professional in Italian town races, and that at the age of 27. And at that time, it was the age when cyclists reached their prime. In the case of Il Diablo, it was those precious vials of Epo hitting his blood at Amazon Prime delivery speed. Suddenly, the little man from the Carrera team began to fly achieving stage victories in Paris-Nice and performing an excellent Giro d'Italia, being top 10 for several days and finishing 12th overall, climbing atop the final podium as winner of the Green King of the Mountains jersey. The Ferrari treatments had been really good for him, but they were going to be even better for him in the Tour de France. The Carrera team had no leader for the general classification, and David Boifava's stable decided to fight for the stages and the secondary classifications with the medical supplements provided by the University of Ferrara. Guido Bontempi and Massimo Gerotto were revived after poor seasons with a stage win each. But someone who stormed the bench was our protagonist of today. Chiapucci managed to get away in the first stage, finishing in the fantastic Futuroscope theme park, with the Canadian who prevented Criquillion from winning a world championship at home, Steve Bauer. The Frenchman of the always clean Z team of Roger Leger and Greg LeMond, Ronan Ponsec, and the head of the Danish Anchovy in the Visma team, and therefore spotlessly unquestionably clean, Franz Massen. Chiapucci couldn't beat the herring and beer-smelling rider, but he achieved his goal to be able to ride the futuristic park rides in the red dotted jersey. What perhaps he didn't expect was that the peloton was going to fall asleep on that day with no understanding at all and give him 10 minutes and 35 seconds of advantage, giving it to that unknown Gregario. Everyone thought Chiapucci would not hold on, but all his breakaway companions fell, and he took the lead on the 12th stage after a time trial in Villa de Lens, with a lead of more than seven and a half minutes over Greg Lamont. The always clean gringo used the Italian's lack of experience to put pressure on him, but Chiapucci, with doses of Ipo he could afford, remember he didn't have Bugno's premium vials, 
He gradually lost time until he immolated himself on the penultimate day, losing the yellow jersey in the final time trial by only 2 minutes and 16 seconds, finishing second on the podium in Paris after having been leader of the general classification for 8 days. It had been 30 years since Italy had had such a successful rider in the Grand Boucle, and that sudden fame and popularity made him climb in purchasing power, giving him the need to continue on the crest of the wave. And so he began to be one of Ferrari's most loyal customers, until he ended his career doped to the gills seven years later. In the documentation seized from Dr. Conconi on one of his computers in 1999, we could observe the incredible fluctuations of Claudio Chiapucci's hematocrit, which in January was a derisory 35%, a percentage only explainable if you've had previously consumed a high amount of EPO, something that it would be literally impossible to compete with, rising to 60% at the highest points of the season. The greater the fluctuation between percentages, the more the increase of red blood cells which would be noticed, and the cyclist's resistance and recovery capacity increases. And so the little Carrera man literally exploited his blood like Tony Montana to his cocaine addict girlfriend, placing himself at the Martian level of riders like Tony Rominger, Pieter Ugrimov, Fernando Escartino, or the faithful friend of the channel, Bianca Rees. After his stealth preparation, he decided to put his focus on Milan San Remo, as Bunio had done the year before. But beforehand, he went to Spain to sweep the Setmana Catalana, a race similar to the Volta Catalunya, where he managed to win the same day, March the 21st, the two stage sectors. A sprint to one of the best sprinters of that time, Olaf Ludwig, and a time trial of 11 kilometers to the Irish doping monster, Stephen Roach both on the same day, on the flat and in the mountains. And then two days later, he travelled to Milan for the Classicissima. No doubt Ferrari's preparation had worked on Il Diablo. It was raining and cold, but the doped-up rider who wore Giro helmets out of obligation was unchained. He knew he was going to win his country's most prestigious one-day race, and on the Turquino, with more than 150 kilometers to go, he attacked on the descent with his teammate Bontempi after a killer climb to shatter the peloton. Next to him, the one treated by Ufemiano Fuentes, Marino Lejarreta, the always clean Charlie Motte, the prologue specialist Yella Naidam and Thierry Marie, and two great dopers, the father of the winner of the 2023 edition, and the Danish, always Danish, Rolf Sorensen, who that year was already in Michele Ferrari's Ariostia, and who months later would give him a yellow jersey in the middle of the Tour de France. Crashes and confusion in the peloton of favourites caused the group of escapees to achieve four minutes of advantage. But of all of them, Chiapucci is the one who continued as, two days before, more on fire than Donald Trump seeing the legs of a 20-year-old Venezuelan. And so he destroyed Charlie Motte and the prologists and the rider doped for eating pigeon pie on the Capo Mele. And shortly afterwards, on the Cipressa, he destroyed everyone else except Sorensen, who, with Ferrari-fueled pluck, tried to hang onto the wheel of the guy no one knew six months earlier, and was now the top superstar of Italian cycling. The duo arrived with only one minute advantage at the base of the Poggio, but the doped devil was saving himself. He saved the best for the mythical climb with a late attack with which the Dane, always the Dane, was left screaming to the sky, wondering why he wasn't bald or married at 21. Not only did he keep the gap to the peloton of sprinters, but he increased it on the flat to the Via Roma to enter fresh as a daisy and flushed Pink as the winner after 150 kilometers with all the air and water in his face. He himself declared that his planning had not changed from the previous year. He simply knew that the sponsors expected a lot from him. A good euphemism to justify that increase in medical expenses. Ah, it just goes to show, as everyone knows, the real doping, it all started with Lance.